Hello, everybody, and welcome to our third lecture on dinosaurs. Today, we are going to finish talking about the theropod dinosaurs, at least as they exist in the Mesozoic, as we continue building a bird, taking all the anatomy that we were able to come together and list that makes birds seemingly so, so, so different from other reptiles, and seeing how those features, those avian traits, actually spread so far across the archosaur, dinosaur, and theropod tree. Many of the things that make birds so unique are shared by lots of animals that you probably wouldn't think themselves are very birdy. Um, I'm very pleased with uh, this title slide, again, by this fabulous artist we've seen so many times before, with a flying bird, little dinosaur, some flying pterosaurs, other flying archosaurs, flying past the head of a great big feathered tyrannosaur. Um, in the early Cretaceous of China. Pretty fun to think about the evolution of these groups and how they fit together in these ecosystems. So what we were saying, right, is if you're building a bird and trying to understand how the unique anatomy of these animals came together, like you said, like I said, you can see it spread across the tree. In the archosaurs, there's parental care and unidirectional airflow. We went through a bunch of these in our last lecture on Tuesday bipedality being a dinosaur trait that birds inherit. Things like a wishbone being really widespread amongst almost all the theropods that it's preserved for. Downy integument spread in some of the theropods, things like tetanurin, so that includes animals like megalosaurs all the way up to birds, potentially homologous. And then of course, where we left off on Tuesday was talking about the celurosaurs. Celurosaurs are the animals that we have the most evidence of feathers for. And there's really complex feather morphologies in many of the different celurosaur clades, all the way towards things like big fans on their tail and long feathers, like true avian looking feathers with a central vein and barbs that stick off the side um, on their arms. Um, so many of these animals have feathers. Many of them are using them for interesting things. Feathers maybe evolve initially as a form of insulation for a warm-blooded animal. That's an interesting idea. And then, of course, imagining ways that evolution by natural selection would act on that kind of downy integumentary covering for display for mate choice. And then giving these billboards almost, we can think of it with these displaying tails and displaying arms. Those are all ideas, and they certainly make biological sense. And it's interesting to me that you can see all these things, the bipedality, the wing-like structures, the pneumatization of the vertebrae, that all modern-day birds are using to fly around. Nothing about flight has anything to do with their early evolution and distribution amongst all these other clades. Flying is something that has not happened yet in dinosaurs as far as we've seen, but we've built so much of this bird skeleton and this bird anatomy. And so let's keep going. Where we left off on Tuesday when lecture ended was we were talking about tyrannosaurs. Uh, easily the most famous dinosaur probably is that one there on the top right. That's Tyrannosaurus rex. You're looking at a beautiful photo of Sue. Uh, the world's most complete Tyrannosaurus rex skeleton on display at the Field Museum in Chicago. Uh, Sue is absolutely spectacular. Uh, it was just remounted a few years ago with those big belly ribs, those big gastralia, really filling out Sue's profile and those gnarly, tiny little arms there. Um, they're not as tiny as you might expect if you hold one of those Tyrannosaur arms, even on a giant T-Rex like Sue. It's about as big as your human arm. You know, that's not so small. It's just it's a huge animal. They're also extremely well muscled, like the humerus there and the forearm bones. And then you can see how big the scapula is. Tyrannosaurs do have relatively small arms, at least the later ones do, but they're certainly not weak arms. And so what's really interesting is, and we talked about this on Tuesday just a little bit, is that Tyrannosaurus rex is an animal at the very end of a long, long, long evolutionary history of its family, the Tyrannosauroids. Tyrannosauroids are small bodied animals uh, like, you know, I always think of them as like the coyotes on the landscape in the Jurassic and the early Cretaceous on the northern continents for the most part. You can find them in Europe and Asia and North America. And it's not until the very end of the Cretaceous, the last like 15, 20 million years or so, that the Tyrannosaurids, a family within Tyrannosauroids, get quite huge. And of course, T-Rex is the largest of them all. And so some of those earlier ones, like Euteranus, that's down there on the bottom right, uh, is a feathered animal. We actually have that skeleton right there of Euteranus that has fluffy integument all up and down its body. So what does that mean for an animal like T. rex? Does T. rex have feathers? 
That's really interesting. Maybe the adults don't. Are there is that like a secondary loss? Like how big mammals like elephants and rhinos are like not very fuzzy? Probably because they have the ability to retain heat from their size and they're not um insulated like smaller animals are in the same clades as them. These are again are all interesting biological ideas. Would a Transverse Rex chick be a little fluff ball and then lose its feathers, lose its fluff as it grows up. That's pretty interesting to think about. So this story of transverse evolution from, for the most part, for many tens of millions of years, being smaller animals until kind of the very end of dinosaur times um, is a fun one. There's a couple animals from the middle part of the Cretaceous, Moros from Utah and Siski Tyrannus uh, from New Mexico. These are both relatively new dinosaurs named in the last five or six years. Um, and what's really fun is that Idaho, we have here in our state, um, fossiliferous middle Cretaceous rocks that you guys have seen a few times already in this class. And there is, believe it or not, a little Tyrannosauroid from Idaho. We only have a few bits and pieces, some teeth um, and a proximal femur that was described two years ago now. Uh, but we actually have one of these guys. And so if you remember on Tuesday, I said that the rocks we have here in Idaho that are just under 100 million years old have the big teeth of like a large allosaur type predator, allosauroid type predator. Um, but then also on the landscape is a little tyrannosaur. And so Idaho does have a T-Rex connection, as we say. Um, but that is, of course, much earlier in time than an animal like T-Rex itself, which is living at the very, very end of dinosaur time. And so as I said before, tyrannosaurs are super well studied. These are maybe not only just the most famous dinosaur, but maybe the most famous fossil organism uh, in all of like human culture and the human uh, scientific endeavor. Like the public really, really, really knows T-Rex and cares about T-Rex. And so tyrannosaurus rex specimens um, are extremely coveted. They're certainly auctioned on and it can be really controversial. We lose them for research. Um, but the ones in museums help us really understand them. When people are out looking for fossils, they are looking for T-Rex a lot of the time, some people. And people out in Montana or in the Dakotas or maybe Wyoming who are looking for Tyrannosaurus rex are looking to fill in gaps in our information about T-Rex. And so what you're seeing here is this really interesting chart uh, where they're taking things like histology is one possible way of looking at growth in an organism. So looking at the growth of long bones under a microscope after you take a thin slice and seeing how they grew up. And then these authors were taking all the different osteological features we can see in tyrannosaurs, how the skull gets wider and deeper, um, how the little horny structures above the eyes get bigger. They'll help us understand Tyrannosaurus rex specifically as a species, the ontogeny, the growth of these tyrannosaurs. So I'm going to Stop talking for a minute. Go ahead and pause this if you can uh, and take a minute to like look at this figure. What's on the x-axis? What's on the y-axis? What's the story here of Tyrannosaur evolution? All those little circles you're seeing are specimens that exist in museum collections. So I'll let you do that. Well, all right. Um, I'm hoping that you are making a couple observations about how the skull of an animal like T-Rex changes through ontogeny. Growth like this, when we have enough fossils to actually see an animal, a species, I mean, grow up from a relatively young individual up into an older individual, it helps us understand how bones change and to set our expectations for when we find more fragmentary fossils. You have to imagine, right, you know, uh, you're not going to get any DNA really, really enough to like sequence it and know who's who at an individual level um, from most tyrannosaur fossils. And so if you only have bits and pieces of bone, how do you know if you have a small animal or if you have, you know, that's a new species or if the little dinosaur you found is actually just a juvenile of a dinosaur that's much bigger? And that's true for all kinds of fossil organisms. And so this is a T-Rex growth curve put together from all these different specimens. You can see estimates the authors have for like the onset of sexual maturity as well as somatic maturity. So sexual maturity means you can reproduce. A somatic maturity means your body is like stopping growing. You've reached your adult body size. So you can see there's a bit of a range there. Um, I think one of the most surprising things about a figure like this is when you look down at the age on the x-axis. And so you can see tyrannosaurs having this like relatively slow start to their growth and then a very quick period of rapid growth in what we can pretty much tell are their teenage years. Um, and then a lifespan that kind of hits uh, an asymptote 
as you get bigger. You know, you, we have a lot of Tyrannosaurus rex specimens from that higher end of the size category. And so uh, circles up there like number 31. 31 is Sue from the Field Museum. And so you can see Sue is estimated to be about 28 years old. Is that old? Is that young? It's really interesting. You know, decades ago, people weren't sure if really, really big dinosaurs were individuals that were extremely old. So this is how animals like T-Rex might have grown, a pretty remarkable growth spurt in the middle part of their life in their teenage years, and then sort of an adult period at this really massive body size. So people have had fun trying to think about what Tyrannosaurus rex social structures might have been like. Would you have like one or two big adults living with a lot of their like children or nieces and nephews rather, and having these animals that are smaller and more fleet footed chase down prey, chase, you know, duckbill dinosaurs towards this big, humongous adult that's part of the group? Is that their social structure? We have no way of knowing that. These are really fun ideas and data like this help us understand like kind of the demography of tyrannosaurs and how they grew up. It's pretty interesting. Something else that's really cool when we think about animals like tyrannosaurus is like We've already met some of these allosaurs like Giganotosaurus and those megalosaurs like Spinosaurus. And like we kind of saw with the sauropod evolution, the long neck dinosaurs, it seems like some of these meat eating dinosaurs, these theropods that do attain these like really massive body sizes do hit similar levels of maximum body mass. You know, there's not one that's like way, way, way bigger than all the others. Different lineages evolve a massive body size and then hit these seeming maybe asymptotes and that might be the constraints put on them by their physiology and their anatomy um, for how big they really can get. And so just like we did with sauropods, I wanted to give you guys a chance to look at like an actual scientific study of body size amongst these animals now. And so I think this is a really wonderful figure. I hope you can see Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous down there on the x-axis. And then what you're seeing is a phylogeny of theropods. We have our birds sticking off on the bottom and some Triassic animals, Triassic cerisians, way down there up at the top, or way, I <laughs> should way down the phylogeny, way up the screen at the top there. And so what you can tell if you look at this is at all those uh, ends of the branches on the phylogeny have a little black circle on them. And the size of that black circle gives you an idea of the body mass of the big individuals in that species. So you see some of them are very tiny and then some of them are rather large. And then the other thing that's happening in this phylogeny is that you are able to see there's color coding, purple to yellow. And that color coding is only possible because people have done histology. They've cut into the limb bones of these animals and looked at their growth. And so what that is, is the log, okay, the, the maximum annual percent growth increase. How much growth is happening within a year, it's pretty much what we can like, simplify that as, of this animal's life. So we can take how big the animal is in an absolute sense, and then the rate of growth each year. So how fast it took to get that big. If I put on a couple silhouettes there, there's Tyrannosaurus, there's some Allosaurus like Giganotosaurus, there's Spinosaurus. Go ahead and pause the video here for a second. Look at this figure, make some interpretations. How are these animals getting big? Are they getting big in the same way? Are they getting big in different ways? Use the colors, use the uh, black circles to make some interpretations. What patterns can you notice? All right, please go ahead and pause that video. Okay, uh, I wish I was there in person to really talk to you guys about this because there's some really fun patterns here and there's some things we're definitely not going to talk about in this one moment. Definitely feel free to ask me. So something that I think you can probably tell is that some of those big black circles have very different colored lines near them. And the same is actually true for some of the small circles too. That shows us that body size and like growth strategy throughout the individual's lifespan don't always line up in ways that make a ton of sense. So this is, or sorry, not they don't make sense, but ways that are predictable where they're all doing it the same way. So this is a really wonderful graph. This is that same theropod phylogeny, and it looks like a big mess of spaghetti all spread around this morpho space. We have body mass on the x-axis and then the maximum growth rate, how fast they're growing on the y-axis over there. And so those funny target looking circles on each of the four corners 
those are the different histological indicators. So that ant one in the far bottom right over there is a really big femur with a lot of growth lines. So it's a big animal that took many, many years to grow up. If you go up on the top right, that's this, another big animal, maybe the same size animal, but you can see there's many fewer growth rings. So that's an animal that got really big and grew up into that size quickly. And the same is true over on the other side when we're talking about small body size. The paper that this figure is from is actually about miniaturization and gigantism, two different size kind of categories that different theropod dinosaurs explore. But I want to talk about the big size and how it fits on here. So if we put our dinosaurs back on there, there's your Spinosaurus. There's a couple different of these giant allosauroids. You can see in terms of the x-axis, they're over about the same way, same distance to the right. So they're about the same mass, but some of them are very fast growing and some of them are very small, or sorry, slow growing. And then there's Tyrannosaurs there too. Tyrannosaurs are in yellow. Some Tyrannosaurs are massive and they grew pretty quickly to get there. Some Tyrannosaurs are similarly massive, but they grew up more slowly throughout their life. So they're older individuals when they get to that same body mass. That is really interesting. So even within these clades, there's a diversity of getting to massive body size. This is another figure from that paper that I think is really fun. It takes like the trends from each of these different species and shows us how they got big or how they got small using histology. It's really, really incredible. So you can see animals like Spinosaurus are huge and they got that way via prolongation. They lived long lives and they grew a little bit each year. Other animals, like some allosauroids are down there, some allosauroids are way up there. They got big because they accelerated their growth. They had huge growth spurts, probably in something analogous to our teenage years to get really big. So there may be younger individuals that are just as massive. And the same thing is true for tyrannosaurs. Some tyrannosaurs, those are all in yellow, um, are a little bit more getting their size from prolongation, so living longer lives, growing for more years, whereas others are getting their body size because they're growing very quickly for a few years. And so Tyrannosaurus rex is more on that side, size increase via acceleration, a growth spurt. It's truly incredible that we can use all these different tools to understand how these animals got to be the way that they are and how they did it differently. And I hope you're also sort of, it's impressed upon you that like, even within the allosauroids, even within the tyrannosauroids, there's different ways individual species do it. Remember that evolution is always happening at the population level. You know, we can talk about these big trends in earth history. We can talk about these huge clades across geological periods, but every time something's actually happening by natural selection, it's happening to individuals in populations. And so it's really remarkable to be able to get this spread. There's no really one clean picture for talking about body size and growth rate. There's many, many, many nuances here. It's pretty, pretty fantastic. It's still cool that they're hitting similar absolute massive body sizes and just doing it in totally different ways. All right, thank you for humor humoring me on that. I think that is a really good juxtaposition with the sauropod body size we talked about earlier. So tyrannosauroids, at least in this class and on this phylogeny, are that first diverging group of uh, the Silurosaurs, these animals that have complex feather morphologies. And you've seen now a few Tyrannosaurs that have different kinds of feathers. But now we'll keep moving up the tree towards our birdie friends. We're talking about these Ornithomimosaurs, these bird mimic dinosaurs. Most of the Ornithomimosaurs are a kind of commonly called ostrich dinosaurs. And so the birds that they're mimicking are ostriches. Uh, that one of the other genera besides Ornithomimus is Struthiomimus, which literally means ostrich mimic. Uh, these animals are probably extremely fast. They have very long and very powerful legs. You might remember the really large Ornithomimid Gallimimus that's in that movie Jurassic Park. The ones that are <laughs> moving in are um, flocking this way. And so a lot of them have very reduced dentition and beaks. Um, they are probably omnivorous, which is kind of interesting. Some of them have sort of tantalizing tiny little teeth adaptations that make us wonder if they're doing some kind of simple filter feeding, which is really cool, sort of like in shallow pools, maybe like flamingo style. That's not very certain, but they have these really interesting dietary ecologies. You can see tiny heads on long necks, that animal ornithomimus. Uh, there's beautiful specimens from Canada that show us those big feathers on those forearms. So this is an animal, again, that is not flying, but probably using feathers for display. 
And so these are probably some of the fastest dinosaurs. And um, um, I think they are pretty interesting in and of themselves. Um, but one thing that this clade is getting more and more famous for is for the really oddball animals that are within it. Animals that are sort of weirdos off of this base model. Animals like Ornithomimus there on the right. And so I'm talking, of course, about one of the most famous of these examples is Dinochirus, which is a set of arms there on the left-hand side of this picture. Those arms were found in the middle part of the 20th century. The arms themselves are like eight feet long. And for many, 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 many years, the only fossils we had of Dinochirus were these arms. And so what kind of nightmare dinosaur must have existed? What kind of terrible, ferocious predator must have been walking around with these huge eight foot long arms with huge claws on the end? Who ever could imagine? Well, of course, you might not be surprised to know, we have found, scientists in Asia have found more fossils of Dinochirus. And we do have an excellent idea now of Dinochirus's full body and what Dinochirus looks like. Um, I was in the room at the conference, the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology conference, when, before this paper came out, when these scientists showed everybody what Dinochirus really looks like. And it's one of only a handful of times I can remember, really one of two specific kind of times I can remember when like a whole room full of scientists like emotionally reacted, like they all went at the same time because it's so surprising. So those gigantic arms, more than eight feet long, belong to an animal that looks like this. Dinochirus is a huge ornithomimosaur, and it's so big that those eight foot arms actually don't look that ridiculous. You can see there's two really nice specimens that were published in that initial publication on Dinochirus a little over 10 years ago. Uh, some things that are really surprising are how tall the neural spines are in the posterior dorsal vertebrae and into the sacrum and onto the tail and how the like vertebral column is bent through there. So there's this big like hump backed uh, structure on something like Dinochirus. It is really, really, really remarkable. Imagine like, I guess, probably like the tendons and muscle that are building off those neural spines to like hold up the front of the body and attach back to the pelvis. This is a really bizarre animal. And what's really great besides it's just body shape um, and how those arms fit on there is its skull. So you can see the larger individual there actually does have a skull. That skull is huge. Look at it in scale next to that guy. Uh, and it's almost like a duck-billed skull. There are no teeth in it. It's, it sort of broadens out at the end, really massive and deep lower jaw. This thing is not at all doing anything too ferocious with those claws. It's almost certainly some kind of herbivorous giant ornithomimosaur. This is not what people expected. And so there's been a lot of really beautiful art of Dinochirus. So there's Dinochirus walking through um, some wetland area with some more traditional, let's say, ostrich dinosaurs there on the left, and then a big armored dinosaur there in the back. This is a really fantastic organism. Again, something that challenges our expectations and shows us how wonderful um, the history of the Earth has been and how many incredible animals have walked on this planet. Dinochirus is just for being such an out there dinosaur. So cool. There have to be more things like this that are just like waiting at our fingertips. All right, next jump up the tree is another batch of these pretty bizarre animals that I really, really like. Uh, these are the Therizinosaurs. Uh, they were for a long time pretty enigmatic, oh my goodness sakes, enigmatic dinosaurs. There were a couple that were known from fragmentary skeletons, like that animal Segnosaurus. And then there were a couple huge claws from Asia. You can see that, how big that finger claw is. That's the terminal bone in the finger of Therizinosaurus from Asia. So sometimes people thought these animals were like early, like relatives of sauropods, like sauropodomorph dinosaurs that somehow existed up into the Cretaceous because their lower jaws kind of look like the simple, like leaf-shaped teeth, downturned end that we see in some of those early sauropodomorph dinosaurs. They are absolutely not sauropodomorphs. We have a much better idea of what they look like now because people have found other species with more complete skeletons. This is Nothronychus, which is known from the US, from the Southwest. And you can see why these animals are now kind of called sloth dinosaurs. They got great big arms. They got huge claws on their fingers. Sloths, giant sloths anyway, are very similar to this. Nothronychus has a pretty capacious gut. Uh, you can see the pubis there is turned backwards a little bit. Um, 
And so there's a lot of space there for a huge gut to probably ferment plant material. The head is, on, is delicate. It's on the end of a really long neck. They've got teeth that are very small, probably leaf eating, uh, well, leaf uh, teeth with little serrations on them for eating things like plants, almost surely. I always wonder what kind of tongues and uh, things like therizinosaurs would have had, probably for like slurping down leaves. It's an interesting idea. I do not remember or know <laughs> if we have any evidence for that. But certainly those great big hands are often reconstructed as like being used to reach and like pull vegetation in close to the animal. So the animal can kind of pop, pop a squat and reach up and just pull tree branches down to its mouth and move its head around amongst them. Really interesting. The really large therizinosaurs, that digit one that on the foot, that toe that's up high on the back of the foot in most theropods comes down onto the ground. And actually you have like a four toed foot in some of the really largest therizinosaurs. So for a long time, people had found these pretty rare, but they still found them four-toed tracks uh, from the Cretaceous. And no one knew what animal could be making four-toed tracks because most all these big dinosaurs, if they have their toes sticking out, are down onto three toes. And so this is probably a therizinosaur. Of course, uh, some of the early therizinosaurs from the Cretaceous, early Cretaceous, I should say, animals like Bapiosaurus there from China are found with fluffy integument running along their bodies. You can see on the back of the skull there and down the neck, then on the back, that sort of long filamentous integumentary structure is present on these dinosaurs, literally. And then, then another one's like Falcarius there is a very small there's an asaur relative to the others known from thing, uh, places like Utah. So it's really interesting to imagine what these animals might have looked like with their fluff fully on and with their arms all tucked up. They certainly had the ability to tuck their arms up, kind of fold them like a bird does today. But these animals, I think you will appreciate, are not all that bird-like. Easily the coolest Therizinosaur is the great big one, Therizinosaurus. That's the owner of those that claw that's there in that picture. Remember, of course, every time you see a claw or a horn on something like a dinosaur and really a lot of fossil animals, what you're seeing is the bone, the actual bone underneath uh, the keratin. The keratin sheath that would have been on this claw would have made it much longer, maybe 30% longer and sharper. And so Therizinosaurus is this totally incredible, like, and you can see what's written there, pot-bellied Freddy Krueger <laughs> sort of amazing organism that again is almost certainly a big, big herbivore on its landscape, very tall. These are cool dinosaurs. If we go up through Therizinosaurus, we can see there's another group that looks a little odd. These are the Alvarez sauroids. Uh, this is a really funny clade. I really um, can't say enough about how fun and interesting they are. You can see animals like Mononychus there on the right. Um, well, actually, I see that. What, what do you notice? So go ahead and do a pause on this. Papalchiris on the bottom is one of the earliest Alvarez sauroids. And so it's from the Jurassic. And you can see it looks a lot like other little theropods with its claws and its teeth and its body plan. So the earliest of these animals look something like Haplochiris. But once we get into the Cretaceous, especially the late Cretaceous, animals like Mononychus are what these dinosaurs look like. So go ahead and pause the video for a second. Look at Mononychus's skeleton. Are you seeing anything bizarre? Like, what are you noticing about Mononychus? All right. I uh, hope you noticed a few things. Uh, first and foremost, you might see that like the fibula is like almost totally not there on the side of the leg. It's a very reduced fibula. Uh, there are no teeth in the mouth of Mononychus. It is an edentulous set of jaws. And then easily, I think the most important thing is Mononychus means single claw. And if you look at the teeny little arms on Mononychus, you can see it's not quite one finger. There are three fingers and two of them are quite tiny, but there is one humongous finger with one humongous claw on each arm. That is super bizarre. Here's a beautiful reconstruction of what Mononychus might look like. Um, I think you will agree it's like a pretty birdy vibe um, with that head and that neck and that uh, body posture, but the long tail though, long bony tail, and then these gigantic claws. So what in the world could an animal like Mononychus be doing? Well, if we look in the modern world to try to get some idea, 
really well muscled forelimbs that have big, powerful claws at the end, paired with long sort of tubular faces that have no teeth in the jaws. There are actually several animals today from different clades that have evolved a very similar morphology. And so it's led paleontologists to really wonder, is Mononychus a like social insect specialist, meaning it eats things like an anteater does, like some armadillos do, like a pangolin or an aardvark does? There's many clades of mammals that have evolved massive claws on their forelimbs, have grown tubular faces with not very much in the way of teeth inside their jaws. All these mammals have great big tongues that they use to lap up those termites and those ants once they use their claws to bust into those nests. Are alvarosauroids a kind of social insect specialist from the dinosaur world? This would be a completely gorgeous case of convergent evolution. Um, really, really fun. I really hope someday people are able to show us with a lot more certainty some of the details of how animals like alvarosauroids evolved and if some of them really were social insect uh, eaters. This is a really cool idea. The next jump up the tree, some of my favorite theropod dinosaurs, the over oviraptorosaur dinosaurs. Uh, these animals were first made really popular after the 1920s when the American Museum in New York City had expeditions to Mongolia with collaborators there. And these animals are oviraptors, which means egg thieves, because they were found in association with eggs that at the time were thought to belong to one of these little horned dinosaurs. And so therefore the oviraptors were stealing the eggs OV raptors. Well, what a shame, because now we know that in fact, most of these sites, even though there are some of those horned dinosaur eggs, of course, known from places like Mongolia, where those expeditions went, a lot of these OV raptorosaurs are actually themselves the parents of the eggs that they are found with. This is an unbelievably gorgeous and important specimen of this oviraptorosaur called Sitapati from Mongolia. What you're looking at is a skeleton. There's like the two feet pointing up towards the top that are in the middle there. And then on both sides of that beautiful plaster jacket, you can see the arms of Sitapati with the long fingers and the long claws on them. And those arms are draped over the eggs. This is an organism, don't know if it's male or female, that died as a, some sandstorm or a dune collapsed and buried it on top of its eggs. It is literally covering its eggs as its last act before a, all of them were buried together. So what a bummer to have these animals be called the egg thieves, when in fact, many of them, we have excellent evidence, were quite good and attentive parents, at least on their nests with their eggs in it. Oviraptorosaurs have a lot of details that birds also have, and many of these specific details are convergently evolved. Things like the beaks of oviraptors. Some of them still retain a couple teeth in their mouth, even though they have a beak. Uh, their tail fans. Oh, here is oviraptor sitting on a nest, and there's that sitapati with a diagram showing you how the feathers of the arm would have been covering those eggs uh, when this animal was buried. Here is the postcranial skeleton of an oviraptor called Nemingia, the pelvis and the limbs and the vertebral column. And those distal caudal vertebrae are fused together in a structure called a pygostyle. This is not homologous to the structure that birds have that we also call a pygostyle. This is an independent evolution of that. What it is is a bunch of caudal vertebrae all fused together. And because of that, they can host many, many feathers that radiate off of them into like a kind of tail fan. Here's a really beautiful oviraptorosaur feather from the early Cretaceous of China. You can see the details of it, uh, that central rachis and then the barbs coming off. This feather has colors and it looks a lot like the feathers that you guys know of from birds. There are tremendously huge oviraptors out there, which I think are so cool. So that scaled picture there in the orange, there's an oviraptor that's like, you know, a four or five foot tall animal crouched onto its eggs. That's what you've been seeing in these other images. And then over top of that is this gigantic animal called a gigantoraptor, pretty incredible name, uh, also from Asia. It's one of these humongous oviraptors. Um, really, really, really surprising that again, animals like this could get that big. This is very, very bird-like without being much of a bird at all. I wanna talk about these giant oviraptors too for a second. 
So Idaho, actually, if you were to say, what's the biggest dinosaur known from Idaho's Cretaceous? The answer is one of these giant oviraptors. The rocks we have here in Idaho are about the same age as the rocks in Asia that produce that animal, Gigantoraptor. And so Idaho's always been famous for having really big oviraptor eggs that we find in our Cretaceous rocks. When we have complete ones, they're about 15 inches long. That is a big, big egg. So if you guys come on down to the museum, you can learn a lot about oviraptors and their reproductive biology and what colors their eggs are, because these are animals that thankfully, because of all these studies in Asia, for the most part, we know a whole lot about how they reproduce. There's some really, really incredible things. This is some beautiful artwork that we had commissioned for our exhibit here in Pocatello. I hope you can appreciate um, how birdy these animals are. This is a non-flying animal. But of course, it's got feathers on its arms, on its tail. It's got a beak up on two legs. This is seeming so bird-like, and yet it's also so very different. Really cool stuff. When we had these eggs, we knew we couldn't just show people eggs to build this exhibit. So myself and some of the techs down at the Idaho Museum of Natural History spent the last few years sculpting from scratch every single solitary bone on a digital uh model software, and then 3D printing them. And then, of course, we had people up at the College of Tech doing auto painting and welding to help build our armature to show you what Idaho's giant oviraptor looked like. So there's me and our education lead building one of the legs. Here's what the hands looked like as they were coming off the printer and being put together. And here's a nice diagram of what it looks like if you come in to see it in the exhibit. Um, pretty special to have an animal like this from Idaho. This is an organism that is just as much part of Idaho's history as things like mammoths and trilobites and the buzzsaw shark. So it's pretty, pretty spectacular stuff to have so many eggs and then to be able to show the public what Idaho used to look like. Something I'll come back to, I think when people, uh, these patterns in body size and, and, and convergence in different clades can be really, really interesting. Nothing about this is really specifically about convergence, but it's showing you three giant theropods, a Therizinosaur, Therizinosaurus, Gigantoraptor, an Ovaraptorosaur, Dinochiris, an Ornithomimosaur. All of these animals have different levels of evidence that they are herbivores, certainly omnivorous at least, and probably herbivores, all of them. Um, these are very fun and surprising organisms. Keep in mind that they are nested deeply within the theropod family tree, the meat-eating dinosaur family tree. And especially with animals like Therizinosaurus and almost and probably Dinochiris, Gigantoraptors may be a little more up in the air. We have really excellent evidence for them being herbivores based on their anatomy, their capacious guts, the way they don't have any teeth, the way their small heads are. These are interesting, interesting, interesting organisms tucked right in there amongst some of the most famous carnivores of all time. Because you can see, as we go up in towards birds, the next group we would run into are the raptors, these dinosaurs that are, like tyrannosaurs, extremely famous for their carnivory. And so that pattern, thinking about um, dietary ecology and what we can expect, carnivory amongst tetrapod groups, small-bodied carnivores, are very often the founding members of all the big radiations of reptiles, and that's true amongst the synapsids, and it's certainly true for things like amphibians. It's very, very, very compelling. Herbivory almost always evolves within a clade. And so if we look at the ancestral diet for theropods, the ancestral diet for dinosaurs, the ancestral diet for archosauria, they almost always optimize as like, yeah, carnivory, 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 carnivory. That's true as you go up the theropod family tree as well. And what I think is kind of fun in Solarosaurs, and this was something that really got me excited about paleontology um, when I was first getting into graduate school, is wondering like, oh my gosh, is there a moment on the theropod phylogeny somewhere in Solarosauria where like we would expect herbivory or some sort of omnivory, if I'm really being specific and uh, not waving my hand so much, something deviating from just strict carnivory somewhere in that part of the tree. So I think something that would be cool is pause the video for a second, read those questions there on the side. How confident can we be of ancestral diet? What kind of information would we need? 
new fossils, new ways of looking at the fossils we have to answer that question. And what are some possible answers to this question of like, what's going on with diet as an expectation along the theropod stem? So go ahead and pause the video and think about that for a second. This is another time when I really wish I was there with you guys because we could really have a lot of fun talking about this. I will tell you there was a time when I thought, oh my gosh, omnivory, omnivory is everywhere. And then maybe our raptors, our animals like Velociraptor or Utah Raptor, things that we haven't seen yet in this class, but we're about to. Are those animals secondarily carnivorous? And of course, as we gathered more and more and more fossils, it seems like within Therizinosaurs, within Oviraptorosaurs, within Ornithomimosaurs, Probably those big members that might be herbivorous and some of those members that lose their teeth and get beaks and all these clades that are probably omnivorous are probably doing it on their own, invading that herbivorous niche space. Early members tend to be the ones that look more carnivorous. And so probably the pattern we're seeing is the same one that we've been seeing, different clades evolving herbivory or at least omnivory in different ways all the time. It's super interesting and super fun. And I really like to be working in a field where as we learn more things, these exciting ideas come up as hypotheses to be tested. Okay, now let's get up there and look at some of these paravians, the group that includes today's birds, all these fossil birds, as well as the raptor dinosaurs, which are so famous. I've got four different synapomorphies I want you guys to have for para-AVs. What you're seeing on this slide is the first bird, the animal Archaeopteryx, which was found in the 1800s in German limestone. This is something that came out after D Darwin had published Origin of Species, and everybody's like, well, look at this little reptile thing that has feathers, those gorgeous wings on the arms, big feather structures on the tail. Archaeopteryx is an extremely important animal, and that fossil is easily the most famous specimen of Archaeopteryx. And then on the right-hand side, that is an animal called Anchiornis. It's a little uh, raptor dinosaur, part of this group called Troodontids. And it itself also has many of the same features that Archaeopteryx has, even though it is on the kind of raptor side of the Paravian family tree. The four features I'd like you guys to have for Paravians, so raptors and birds, are a greatly enlarged manis, meaning a great big hand. So remember, we saw elongated arms and hands in Solarosaurs. Well, once we get into Paravians, the hand especially gets quite long. There's airfoils on the limbs. And so what I mean by that is not just like, oh, there's feathers present on the body. There's long feathers present on the limbs. I mean that the uh, feathers on the forelimbs are like together integrated to form like something in, that is an airfoil, something that can act in an aerodynamic way and potentially provide lift to this animal. Once we look at the skeleton of these animals taken out of the rock and put back together, so we're still looking at Archaeopteryx there on the left and Anchiornis, the little raptor there on the right. I hope you can see that they are pretty similar, these little tiny theropods. So a third feature, third snapomorphy of Paravians is a shortened trunk. So the number of vertebrae between the pectoral girdle and the start of the sacral vertebrae uh, between the ilia. That is much reduced. We have a short little trunk in these paravians. And then finally, 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 a retroverted pubis, a pubis that is now angling backwards. Now, you've seen a couple of the other dinosaurs, like the therizinosaurs, on their own sort of do some reversion of the pubis. And remember, this condition, bird-hipped pubis, is the default for all the ornithischian dinosaurs, which we have not yet talked about in this class, animals like triceratops and duckbill dinosaurs. But here at Paravians, within Theropoda, this is that retroversion of the pubis that modern day birds do inherit. And so these little guys are in fact the birds that are bird hipped finally, which is pretty fun. So let's talk about the raptors in terms of their biodiversity and some of like the fun things we know about them. You can see they have a record that goes back farther than a lot of the other clades from the Cretaceous. Some raptors are known all the way back into the Jurassic period, almost as old as some of these birds that we know about. And so there's a couple clades of organisms within this uh, 
category I'm calling raptors. Believe it or not, the phylogeny of these paravians, these troodontids, these dromaeosaurs, there's a few other clades, these early birds, all have teeth, all have claws, all have feathers. The phylogeny can get pretty uncertain, and some of these animals bounce around uh, between the different groups. And so I'm just calling them raptors because I'm meaning all of the non-bird paravians over here. These animals are absolutely uh, just like T-Rex and just like some of the sauropods we've met, pop sci icons. Jurassic Park back in 93 made them very, very famous with the killing claw on digit two of their foot. So a huge claw that they keep retracted up off the ground. Something that's fun about that is that when we find the footprints of dromaeosaurs, they usually have only two toes on the ground because that third toe is being held aloft and presumably to keep that claw nice and nice and sharp. And so uh, on the right-hand side of this image, what you're seeing is uh, one of the forearm bones, the ulna of Velociraptor. And so Velociraptor's arm has these little bumps running down the ulna. And then C there in that figure is the arm bone of a great big bird today. And we can see the primary feathers, like the flight arm, uh, sorry, the flight feathers and the forearm of like an eagle, say. We can see how the feathers articulate with those little bumps on these big, powerful flying wings of a modern bird. And under an SEM, we can see that, uh, or maybe it's not an SEM, under the, um, yeah, oh, no, no, okay, sorry about that. We can see the um, bumps on the on the forearm of Velociraptor, showing that it also had these big feathers sticking off of its arms. Some of the earliest of these raptor dinosaurs, animals like Anchiornis, are from the Jurassic period. Microraptor is a little dromaeosaur from the Cretaceous period, and they're not too big. These are small-bodied organisms. We see the common ancestor of Paravians as like, you know, an animal that could really like land on your arm. You could hold it up on your arm. Um, and we're having them often found in forested habitats. You can see that they have great big airfoils on their forelimb that look a lot like the wings of birds. Many of them also have airfoils on their hind limb. Their leg has a wing, quote unquote, sticking off of it, and not to mention the big spread on their tails. These are really interesting organisms. Anchiornis is one of the animals that we actually have a decent idea of its color scheme, at least the patterning on its body. So that sort of black and white coloration with some sort of rusty or red color on the top of the head and the back of the neck. That is pretty wild to have a like almost woodpecker color scheme on this little dinosaur. So Anchiornis is one of the few animals we have a good idea of its color, or at least a, a constrained idea of its color and its pattern. Microraptor, it's often like kind of jokingly called this like four winged raptor because of the big airfoils it has on its legs. This uh, painting by Brian Chu is one of my like favorites because the ginkgo tree that these animals are in, we find fossils of those leaves in the same spot we find fossils of these early birds in the same spot we find fossils of Microraptor. And there's even a specimen of Microraptor with the leg of one of these birds inside its gut cavity because it probably ate that bird. So that's a very accurate piece of paleo art there in the forests of China and the early Cretaceous, <laughs> giving us some idea of what happened. Microraptor is another one of these dinosaurs. We have some idea of its coloration. So it's a very dark colored animal, as far as we can tell, and has some level of iridescence in its plumage. So you can think of it kind of like a crow color scheme. That is very magical and very fun that we can know that. So you can see a lot of these early raptors, remember birds themselves, the earliest birds like Archaeopteryx are back in the Jurassic with animals like Anchiornis. These early Paravians are extremely bird-like. A lot of the most famous of the raptors, the ones that are big and scary in movies, and I agree with what is written on this slide, some species are upsettingly scary, are gigantic animals. Uh, so there's Velociraptor there on the lower left, not as big as you might expect from the movies. Animals like Microraptor flying there also on the left, or gliding, I should say. But there are a couple of species of these dromaeosaurs that are really big, animals like Utah Raptor, is an extremely <laughs> scary predator, a huge raptor, like 20 feet long, gigantic claws. Um, yeah, I don't have much else to say other than these are really upsettingly scary. One thing that's really um, exciting and maybe startling about some of these really large dromaeosaurs uh, is that it's possible that these are like secondarily not flightless maybe, but like secondarily not using their feathers to get around. 
So we think that some of these early Paravians are certainly gliders in the forests of the late Jurassic and the early Cretaceous, using their feathers, jump out of trees and fly around. Gliding evolves many, many, many times amongst modern tetrapod groups. There's gliding frogs, there's gliding lizards, there's gliding snakes, many kinds of lizards, many kinds of mammals, not just animals like flying squirrels. And so gliding as a little raptor dinosaur in the forest seems really likely. And so it's also interesting to think about how gliding might be involved in actual birds starting to power flight, flap their wings, because gliding is not flying. Um, gliding is controlling your descent. Flying is actually using power to move around in the ecosystem, to move up through the air. So it's possible that gliding is a thing that all these paravians are doing. And some of these gigantic raptors that exist later in the Cretaceous maybe don't glide anymore, but they might have ancestors that did. That's possible anyway. That's really interesting to think about that as a biology. Um, I always feel really bad for this uh, ornithischian dinosaur here who's getting attacked by these Utah raptors. That is not a family you want to have to deal with. And so by the time we get to Periwees, you can see we have even more features in line for our bird building that we're doing. The big hands, the feathers as airfoils, a shortening of the trunk, and finally a retrovated, retroverted, I'm sorry, bird pubis, ornithischian style pubis, except it's not ornithischian, it's true ornith. It's the birds getting the retrovated pubis finally. So let's actually talk about birds. So here's Archaeopteryx. You've already seen that image of the skeleton. You've, and now here's that uh, diagram of the uh, reconstructed skeleton as well. When you take off all the feathers and put this animal back together, and you can see how long its arms are. You can see how big its hand is. It's still at a mouthful of teeth. It has a little upraised second toe there on the foot. Interesting, but it's still a long bony tail that go with those pointy teeth. This is how we have chosen as scientists to define birds. Archaeopteryx just in and of itself defines anything close to Archaeopteryx and after Archaeopteryx is a bird. But I don't think this animal is, now that we know so much about other Paravians, all that much different. And I think that's really important. That's what we should expect to see in the evolution of life. We should expect to see if we get enough fossils a graying of the boundaries. It should be more difficult to tell organisms apart from one another. And so the early bird really isn't too different from some of these earliest raptor perivians. I think that's really special. So there's our avian lineage that goes all the way back into the Jurassic. And so it's interesting, we talked about it in class, that we have a bird fossil record that's older. And by bird, I mean these avialians, Archaeopteryx and all of its relatives that are including modern birds that go back farther than a lot of these dinosaur clades, farther than Therizinosaurs, farther than Ornithomimosaurs into the Jurassic. Now I want to take the chance to like blow that arrow up and show you guys some of the actual bird, true bird diversity that existed during the Cretaceous. Birds were a part of dinosaur ecosystems for like many, many, many tens of millions of years. You can see it's almost a hundred million years of the Mesozoic that there's animals that you would probably be comfortable calling a bird flitting and flying around. You don't have dinosaurs going extinct at the asteroid impact. And then birds are just living dinosaurs that are still here. There's birds for a hundred million years of time that you would definitely call dinosaur time, the late Jurassic and the whole of the Cretaceous. So if we blow up that arrow, we get a lot of different birds. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about how those birds maybe got their flight. And so you can see this phylogeny. This is what you've seen before. There's Paravies, and then on the left is raptors, and on the right are the true birds. And what you're seeing here is the different airfoils on their bodies, the uh, wings on the arm, the like quote unquote wings or the airfoils on the legs, and then their expanded tails. And so you can see after Archaeopteryx, there's a couple of these birds that have these fancier pants tails, but you lose the airfoils on the legs. As birds probably developed their own ability to do powered flight, they're moving probably from something like a glider who just wants a lot of surface area to something that has a pretty sculpted wing that's used to actually power the animal through the air. So animals like Sapiornis and Jehulornis, all the way up to Columba, which is the living pigeon, we're seeing an emphasis on the tail for steering and then all the power coming from the forelimbs. And so there's probably a lot of experimentation in gliding early on in perivian evolution. 
Uh, and one of the reasons I wanted to show you guys this is to show you another group of organisms that's sort of part of this conversation, but absolutely doing their own really, really, really weird thing. Way off to the left there, I hope you can see Epidex ipterix, uh, which is one of these really, really bizarre animals that's only alive in the Jurassic during this time of experimentation in the gliding arena. So I'll let you take a second to look at Scansoriopterygids. There's two of them here, Scansoriopteryx itself on the right and Epidex ipteryx on the left. These are some really wild Jurassic evolutionary experiments. These are animals that are not very common to find in the record. Almost always throughout Earth history, arboreal animals, animals living in trees, make very poor fossils. They're not often fossilized, and many of them are small. They have delicate bones, and they're not likely to fossilize even if they're fallen into the right habitat, even if they fall down into a pond. It's really rare for them to fossilize, and of course, we have to find those fossils. So I always think of these animals as something that really challenges us because it makes us think, oh my gosh, what else are we missing if these animals existed in the middle and late Jurassic, and they're this bizarre? Let's go ahead and take a second, look at these Scansoriopterygids and tell me what you think. Well, I hope you're noticing uh, very different things uh, going on with their jaws. Epidex ipteryx has these procumbent teeth in the lower jaw and the upper jaw, but really, really dramatically in the lower jaw. Scansoriopterygis has very tiny little teeth, but it has a humongously long uh, fourth digit or third digit rather, I'm sorry, on its hand. Also a big long finger on Epidex ipteris. Epidex ipteris also has remarkable tail feathers, these huge feathers sticking way back straight off its tail. Um, these animals are so bizarre. People actually wonder if animals like Scansoriopteryx are doing things that the I.I. does today. The I.I. is a very specialized lemur in Madagascar that has one really, really long finger that uses to root around in holes in the tree, tree bark to pull out things like grubs. And that's why they gave this one sort of a uh, um, woodpecker color scheme. These are weird animals. And if I only showed you these, you'd be like, why is he showing us these? These are little tree climbing dinosaurs, maybe. That's very cool. What does it have to do with this story about perivians and experimentation when it comes to getting around as gliders in the Jurassic? Well, there are some even weirder Scansoriopterygids. These two, one's called Ambopteryx and the other one's called Yi, are truly shocking. When these animals first came out, and they're both only got found in the last eight years or so, um, I was blown away. So you can see the skull of Yi down there in the bottom on the right as the orbit. And then on the left in that image, you can see it's like little procumbent teeth. These are dinosaurs that have feathers. They have like a fluffy integument on their bodies, but they're moving around, probably gliding. We don't know if they can really fly, but probably gliding, but not with their feathers. They both have a really long rod sticking off of their hands posteriorly. That rod is not one of their fingers. That is not like a pterosaur where you have one, two, three fingers and then a fourth finger that sticks backwards. That rod is one of their carpals. It's one of their wrist bones that's sticking far back and actually stretching out a, a skin structured wing like a bat would do with its finger. And flying squirrels and other gliding mammals today do use like carpals to like hold up some of the skin that they stretch between their arms and legs to make the airfoil to glide around in the forest. But think about what I'm showing you right now. These are little feathered theropods that live in trees and they are gliding not with an airfoil made from their feathers. This is very early. Maybe the feathers aren't as uh, completely avian as they are in the bird clade, which is at a very similar time. But in this clade, there is a, in a skin structured wing stretched between these fingers and that wrist bone. So they are gliding around, but they're not using their feathers. They're using skin like a gliding bat structure 
This is so wild. And again, I just can't say enough. It should make you really want to know what else we're missing from the forests of the last couple hundred million years, because these animals are not at all something I think anybody could have suspected. Really, really wild. And so like I was saying a second ago, um, birds themselves show up in the Jurassic and they're around all through the whole rest of the Mesozoic. And so I wanted to break up that big long arrow to give you guys an idea of the diversity of some of those birds. And so there's that. Here's now our complete or at least more complete Mesozoic Jurassic Cretaceous focused theropod tree, all the way from those early theropods and ceratosaurs to the crown group birds over there on the right, the lineage that leads to ostriches, the lineage that leads to fowl, meaning like chicken-like birds and duck-like birds, and the lineage that leads to all the other birds being represented by the magpie there, crown birds on the far right. You can see now that Archaeopteryx is properly set in the Jurassic and we've broken up Evialia, there's several other lineages that are really interesting and doing a lot in bird evolution throughout the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. There's aves today, crown birds, the common ancestor of all the living birds and all their descendants. There's three synapomorphies sort of spread through Mesozoic bird evolution that I want you guys to know that will help us finish building our bird. The first is the pyga style. So the avian version of that thing that over raptors you've already seen also evolved on their own. And so that is a shortened tail. And then the distal caudal vertebrae is all fused together to host like the tail fan um, that modern day birds have. A little bit farther up that bird family tree is when birds get that keeled sternum. So that deep sternum we talked about in class that can host the massive flight muscles used to move the wing up and down, power strokes. So you can see a lot of these birds before that that were quite diverse are really birds, but they don't have that big, deep keeled sternum. They're obviously flying, but they're doing it differently. And then finally, that last red tick mark that on this phylogeny anyway is only referring to crown group birds is that loss of teeth, the marginal dentition, teeth in the maxilla, teeth in the dentary. You guys did a great job in class thinking up all the ways that birds are set apart from other reptiles, bipedality, feathers, no teeth. The fossil record shows us these amazing things and how they evolved and in what order they evolved. And maybe that gives us an idea of asking questions of how they might have evolved. I think it's amazing that so many of the birds in the era of dinosaurs, you're going to hear about them in a second, have their teeth. The loss of teeth is something that is only true for the modern day bird groups. That's really, really fun. So let's talk about some of these clades. So I'm going to show you two at a time here. These are the Confucius Ornithiformes and the N. Antiornithes. So what I like about these guys in terms of summarizing them is they really are very familiar. There's lots of birds doing lots of familiar things, living in the forest, walking on shorelines, interesting feathers that are almost certainly for display, a crest on the head and a bird like Ian Ornis, those long tail feathers on Confucius Ornis. But they have teeth. There's teeth in all their jaws. And if you look closely at their little wings, there's claws on the tips of their fingers. So that beautiful uh, picture at the top there of long uh, Longipteryx, you can see that there's little claws sticking out in the front of the wing. So still have claws, still have teeth, otherwise little birdie guys. Longipteryx actually only has teeth up in the premax there, the very, very, very front of its little beak still has teeth in it. Really wild stuff. Confucius Ornus there is a really special bird to me because there are many, many, many thousands of fossil specimens of it in China. And about half of them have those long tail feathers and the other half don't. And so it seems pretty clear to anybody who knows anything about birds, these are probably males and females. So I love that picture of them in a ginkgo, which is a species of ginkgo that's found in the early Cretaceous of China with this male making noise and showing off his tail feathers to that female. Really, really fun. And then just remember, he's got little teeth and little claws. Very different. 
So those N antiornithes, you can see they exist for almost the entirety of the Cretaceous. Um, they are very, very, very diverse. N antiornithes are like the most diverse and abundant birds in dinosaur time. There's a lot of them doing a lot of very different things ecologically, but still being little toothed birds all throughout the Cretaceous. We're going to talk about them in lab when we talk about the end Cretaceous mass extinction, because these are very, very diverse organisms, this clade that's almost globally distributed, that goes extinct at the asteroid impact. And of course, you guys know, common ancestor of like today's birds did not go extinct. And so we're going to talk about that in lab. There you can see on Confucius Ornus and in Antiornus down there, that Pyga style. So I'm going to try to show you those three characters, those three snake morphies I just put on the tree on the last slide, kind of as we walk through this bird diversity. Another true group, another two groups of birds, uh, these two associated with the marine realm, their fossils are very often found in marine rocks, uh, the Hesper ornithiformes and the Ichthy ornithiformes. And so Hesper ornis is a bird that you guys actually already saw when we had our marine reversions lab. This is a bird that fully commits to a life in the ocean. Huge legs that stick out to the side with big old probably palmate toes, big patches of skin on those toes, and really, really, really reduced forelimbs, almost no arms at all. This is a like marine bird, even more extreme than penguins. Hesperornis can, itself can be pretty big. It can be like as big as you are, like five-ish, almost six feet long. This is a big bird. And it's, again, still has teeth in the maxilla, teeth in the denaries, and uh, almost certainly a fish eater. So swimming out there in those big, dangerous, Cretaceous oceans and catching fish is this bird that is really, really wild. Ichthyornis is a bird uh, that represents a, a bigger group um, that it is in. But Ichthyornis is a really famous animal because it's been known since the 1800s. And in the last few years, we found a lot more specimens of Ichthyornis. And the people that have been studying Ichthyornis have published some absolutely gorgeous studies to help us understand the palate of these animals. We're going to talk about bird palates for the crown group and why they're important in lab later. And really figuring their anatomy in great detail. These birds that are, are often sort of thought of kind of colloquially as being very seagull-like back in the Mesozoic. Like I said, they're often found in marine rocks, um, being able to walk, being able to swim, being able to fly around. But again, these are toothed birds. Something that you'll notice though, maybe about Ichthyornis is that Ichthyornis shares with the modern day crown group of birds, a massive keeled sternum. So look at this animal. It is so, so, so like the modern day birds. It looks so much like it. And then if you squint and look at the skeleton, it's got a mouthful of teeth. It's the only feature we have left to really build on to get to modern day birds is that tooth loss. And of course, that is the next thing that happens in bird evolution. But I'll stop there for today because we're definitely gonna be talking more about birds in lab. I hope when you look back at this slide and like maybe watch this video and look at your lecture notes, you can really sort of build for yourself the idea of how a uh, animal with a derived body type, uh, like a bird, we can use fossils to really understand where that anatomy came from. And then really try to think of all the different ways natural selection might have yielded that anatomy in groups of organisms that are using that same anatomy for completely different purposes. It's really, really, really a wonderful example of how different lines of evidence can help us understand the world. Building a bird and seeing all the ways their anatomy is spread across bigger reptile groups, way more than just them. All right, I hope you guys have a really wonderful spring break and I will see you after.